Today is the day I finally get to check out a 50s Les Paul. Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. I teased you guys about this episode a few weeks back. That's right. This is a 1954 Gibson Les Paul in this box. It's the first time I've ever touched an actual 50s Les Paul. Like, I've had the Melody Makers, and I've had, like, a few various arch tops over the years, but as far as a golden era Les Paul standard, let alone with a story, this is a very, very iconic moment for me. But I do want to tell you guys, this is in on consignment. I did not purchase this. This is a consignment piece, so please check it out on my website if you are interested in owning a piece of Gibson history. Well, at least an interestingly modified piece of history anyways. I'm sure most people would view this as a dog, but man, we're gonna have a great time sharing the tale of this beast. So first off, you're probably wondering, hey, where's our Lifton case, if this is a 50s Les Paul, is this a clickbait title? No, the owner of this guitar swapped this out, and he couldn't remember when he did it, but looking at this, it was definitely sometime in the early 90s. The original Lifton case will come with this guitar. You can see photos of it right here on the screen. It's pretty beat up. He didn't want to ship it in that, and, you know, it was probably a good thing. But all right, you guys ready for an interesting tale today? Inside here... Sleeps. <laughs> I love it already. Yeah, so this is a 1954 Gibson Les Paul standard that has led a very interesting life. And it's just going to be so much fun to, you know, experience a 50s Les Paul in the first place. And second, just document this very, very interesting tale. So first off, let's talk this guitar. It originally started life as one of these guys right here, a gold top that had a wrap tail piece. But through the hands of a few different owners here, it has become a double cutaway monstrosity, still with P90 pickups though, believe it or not. Nobody ever routed it out for humbuckers, but we've got the ABR1 bridge. You've got the regular tail piece all the way decked down to the body. Man, this is... This is something else. That's really cool. You can just barely see the original serial number right there. It looks like 42544. We've got really old Grover tuners on this, so that means the headstock has been reamed out for those. But it's kind of cool. It's slotted screws, vintage style truss rod cover. I really like that we still have the original finish on the neck. Like, that feels really good to me. Like, it's chunky, but not overly chunky. This is what everybody talks about when they think, you know, 50s Les Paul neck profile. Now, obviously, this thing did not start life as a double cut. That was done later on in its life. So the back here, they had to have refinished it, moved our toggle switch. They even shaved down a little bit right here when they did that double cutaway. And that was a really genius move to put the reverse stinger down here. Nice. And take a look at this top. There is some very nice flame figuring underneath there. It looks like a three-piecer. Not a lot of movement, surprisingly. But man, this thing is so resonant. Like, everything's vibrating through it. Looks like we've got an inlay that's kind of popping out right there. We should be able to take care of that, hopefully, but yeah. I think it's time for me to share the tale of this guitar with you. Imagine, it's the late 60s, and you're 16 or 17, and you have always wanted a Les Paul. But currently, you only had a Jaguar and an ES335 12-string that you had strung up as a 6-string, because that's all you could afford at the time. This is the story of Vance, the owner of this guitar. Vance was a high schooler that really liked to play music. He had those two guitars, but he had always wanted a Les Paul. But in his current band, the bass player's brother was selling this 50s Les Paul standard. It looked like this. It was a 1954. It had a red top, it had a wrap tail piece, and everything else was original on it. He purchased it from him in 1968 for around $100. 
But as this guitar started to become his number one player, he never liked the toggle switch location in the upper bout. He would always accidentally hit it. And he could never quite reach those upper frets super comfortably like some of the other instruments that he had enjoyed playing over the years. So that's when he went to Rudy, a guy who used to work at Guitar Gallery, which was a very big shop in Chicago back at the time. But this was when Rudy started his own shop called The Sound Post. He's the one who had this double cut modification done to this guitar. He had the back and sides painted black and he moved the toggle switch and replaced the pots. This was around 1969, but then around 1970, once he had worked up a little bit more money, he took this to Paul Staples, where he finally decided to finish off the job of what he wanted to make this the ultimate player's guitar. He hated the rap tailpiece. He wanted it to be the ABR1 and stop bar tailpiece for better intonation. And on top of that, the Klusen tuners just weren't doing the job, so he grovered it out. So that is how we got to this right here. Ever since then, he pretty much just played it in some gigs. He never necessarily got super far or anything like that, but he did jam with some slightly notable people and showed this beast off to some famous people who have tried to purchase it. Let's continue on our tale. All right, so some of those bands that he would jam with are members from The Flock and The Mods, but he'd play bars in this, but he stopped playing around his mid-20s and settled down for a regular job, went to school, and just played for pleasure up until his 40s. But this guitar has sat pretty much unused for the past 20 to 25 years since then. And it was at that point in time that a viewer of the show who had always fawned after this guitar because he was always buddies with Vance, he reached out to him and said, hey, you should send this into Trogley if you're looking to sell it. He wanted to buy it, but he didn't quite have the money. <laughs> so he wanted to at least see it get documented. And his friend's name is Chris. Chris had worked with record companies back in the day, and there was a time when Dave Davies of the Kinks was shown this guitar just, you know, by chance in a hotel, and his managers were saying, you can't sell this to him. You can't. He's bought too much on this tour. But Dave Davies apparently wanted to buy this because of how well it played. And this is all post-modification, so, you know, Davies, if you're out there, I would love to see if you remember this guitar. Because wouldn't that be funny if it just came full circle and came back into your collection? I can totally see why he would have wanted it. It is incredibly comfortable to play up here. And it's all because they also shave some away from that heel right here. But it's still pretty blocky, so I don't think we have to worry about the neck moving or anything like that. There was also a time when Ray Pederick apparently wanted to borrow this guitar, but Vance was swayed away from doing that because apparently Ray has a, uh, a tendency to be pretty rough on guitars. <laughs> but he was with the group Survivor, you know, Eye of the Tiger and all these other great hits that you can see here on the screen. So that borrowing session got denied. So that is the tale of this guitar. He did not know if it originally started life as a red top. I mean, I think I've heard about Red Top Les Paul standards, but they're pretty rare. I mean, this finish feels pretty good, but we'll have to take out the pickups to see if they're still original and whatnot. See if there's original gold paint in there, or is this something even a little bit more rare than we even expected when he sent it in? So I think that's a pretty good first take on everything that I can see here. It's just... It's otherworldly, you know, to finally get my hands on one of these. Sure, it's kind of a, a basket case, but I've always liked basket case guitars anyways. I mean, double cutaway Les Paul, man, before the double cutaways even existed. It's got some nice age to it. So let's go ahead and throw this thing on the workbench and take an inside look of a 50s Les Paul standard. We know the owner's tale of this guitar, now it's time to look at the bare basic facts to learn the rest. As I said before, he bought this as red, he always assumed this was the original finish. The moment of truth falls underneath our pickups. Yep, the start of life is a gold top, you can still see the original gold finish in there. There's no doubt about that in my eyes. You can also see the long neck tenon, and this is one of those guitars that's always happy to see ya! Because the tenon makes the smile, and then the two screws for the P90s makes the eyes. But let's go ahead and take a second to look at these pickups. He thought they were the originals. I'm going to confirm I believe they are also the originals. I never realized that the 50s P90s had this weird black circle on the back that the wires would go through. 
But in comparing other 54 gold tops, the photos that you can find online anyways, that does appear to be the way that they did it. So cool, I learned something new. And then our bridge pickup looks pretty much the exact same right here. It is just covered in this like white dust. <laughs> I know sometimes I'd find that on like late 70s models, but like this is like twice as much because it's almost twice as old. <laughs> But here you can see the original gold paint in this pickup cavity as well, including your screw holes that you mount the P90s with. So yes, indeed, it was a gold top. However, this finish was at least put on in 1969. And that was, you know, before the whole double cut thing even. So it's a very old finish in its own right. It feels good to me. Like it was definitely a quality finish, nothing like super rush job. Now I'm sure there's more professional finishes that you could put on it, but it doesn't feel nasty is what I'm saying. It feels nice. I don't know what was used. I can't guarantee you it's nitro. I mean, I'm not seeing any finish checking, so maybe there's some more modernized plasticizers and whatnot in the finish. I'm not an expert on that. I'm just presenting the facts that I know. And I was kind of in a dilemma here. Do I clean this guitar? Do I just leave it as is? I made the ultimate decision. I'm just gonna leave it as is. It doesn't feel grimy. I mean, sure, it's got some fingerprints, it's got nicks and dings. I could spend two hours polishing this thing, but it just doesn't feel right to me. This guitar just, just wants to be played. Like, I didn't even wanna touch the fretboard because all the wear on this just looks right. The frets aren't completely rusted out or anything. So I think I will leave that to the next owner to decide if they wanna do anything. But I mean, it looks good to me. I just dusted it off. It was definitely well taken care of. But now for the interesting part of what hides under here. I was too curious, I had to take that off. So yes indeed, this is the original wrap tail. And when I was looking closer at this, I truly believe these are the original studs that used to be right here. But then when I was looking at the current tailpiece on here, I was like, huh. You can actually see where the strings were wrapped over top of that and the intonation adjustment screw. So this is likely the original one. It looks like it might have been uh, shaven down a little bit in these areas because that thing is decked down flat to the top. It's a very low profile. The ball end of the strings actually hang out there. But whoever did this modification here, it looks like they filled that in with just like a, a wood filler putty. And I'm not sure if it was strong enough. I'll throw the bridge back on so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. There's definitely a significant stud lean that's going on, so you might want to recorrect that if you're really picky with intonation. And on top of that, since that's been decked down to the body, the bridge is pretty well collapsed. So when I restring this, I think I'm going to top wrap it to kind of relieve some of that pressure. I mean, yes, it has some collapsing to it, but it's not like the worst I've ever seen. Now, I've got to be careful on this bridge because the retaining wire is missing, so all these saddles are going to fall out. It did have one at one point in time. So looking at this one, seeing that patent number, this tells us this is actually a late 60s, early 70s version. An original 50s one would just say Gibson ABR1. So it should play okay as is, but it'd be pretty easy to uh, take all that stuff out there, put actual wood inside of it, and then re-drill it the way it's supposed to be, put a new bridge. I mean, hopefully the new owner doesn't take this and then continue to route it out for humbuckers, but I guess, what does it really matter at this point? It was a wrap tail, now it's a ABR1, which just needs some modifications. It's not quite good enough of a top to make it a burst conversion because it's at least two pieces. I see one seam line right here, and I can't quite see the one over here, but I'm sure it's there somewhere. But it's got some decent figuring under there. It's kind of cool. But moving on here, when I took the pick guard off, like most of the screws on this thing have been replaced at one point in time. But this looks like a very aged looking pick guard, but the back actually has some black paint on it. So what I'm hypothesizing is when they did the side refinish of the black, you know, the pick guard was standing by somewhere, accidentally got sprayed. They didn't care back then. That's kind of cool to see one of these things up close. Next up here, we've got our toggle switch down there. <laughs> Originally up here, he just didn't like accidentally whacking it all the time. So he had it moved down here. Now you can see when they did that modification, they must have like uh, cracked the top or something right there. So there's some sort of like a patch or repair right here that likely happened during the time of this. And just in case you do buy this guitar, you can't tighten this all the way down or it doesn't stay in the bridge position. You need to just Loosen that a couple of turns and then you're good to go. But now we'll take a look at our knobs. They're the golden speed knob style right here. 
They're looking pretty cool with their thumb bleeder still on there. Now, I've been told that the electronics were replaced, so we'll have to wait till we get onto the back side of this to see if those are still original or not. But the knobs look correct to me. But we've still got the binding all around this guitar. They had to do something around this corner. It's not, I'm not quite sure what they did because it looks like you can see wood right here, but that just might be the new binding material that they had to splice in. I'm not really seeing like any obvious join lines. So whoever did that, they at least did it pretty okay. Like they could have used a little bit of more touch up to the lacquer to match the same color as what's on the rest of the guitar. I'm sure if you wanted to clean this job up, you could. And it's not a perfect double cut. Like you can clearly see that's a little bit more wide, but they just got enough out of the way. They weren't too bothered by making it completely symmetrical. But that's our maple top with a mahogany body. It is so resonant. I strum this thing, the whole guitar is vibrating. It's like, oh yeah, that, that, that's what people talk about. But that's true on modern day guitars too. You can find some good ones like that. But here is our awesome Brazilian rosewood fretboard with our inlays here. Pretty much every area that you see that is dark, that is an area of wear where somebody's nail has been like digging into it. So I'm not sure if he was the main player of this one or if that was like that when he had purchased it in 1969, but it's got some significant wear to it. But surprisingly, the frets are actually in pretty darn good shape. Like a level recrown, I think would do the trick. I don't believe it's been refretted but most of the fret nibs appear to have been worn off. These are rather skinny frets. They're not super tall by any means. And you can see all the lacquer's kind of been worn off the edges, but you can see the tortoise shell side marker inlays right there. That's pretty cool. And the third fret inlay, it is popping up. That can cause your string to buzz. That'll be easy enough to glue back down, but I don't have the right stuff with me today. We've got a 12 inch radius with a 24 and three quarter inch scale length. Well, let's go ahead and capture the next specs here get 1.67 inches at the nut, 2.06 by the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.92, and at the 12th, 0.97. It's a chunky neck. Not overly chunky, but definitely a full profile. Here it is on the contour gauge, first fret and 12th fret. You can see it's just a nice rounded neck. It really is very similar to what you would find on like the 50s Les Paul standards from the Gibson USA lineup today. Like it's not overly huge, but it's still big. Man, now I wanna get like a real 57 gold top and see how those things are actually in the flesh. But you also have to remember, each and every one of these is going to be a little bit different. Moving on to our headstock, we can see our truss rod cavity here. Now that looks to me like limited adjustability. Like you can't go too much farther with the truss rod until you might need to do a reset on that. Really hard to show this in video, but the neck looks straight to me. I don't see any crazy warpage. So I think you should be good on this one for quite some time. Sometimes when truss rods get to that area, they start to twist and you have to relax them. But I would say this one looks okay. And I noticed this bottom screw is pretty well stripped out. It doesn't, it, it secures, but it doesn't like come up on its own. Like when you're trying to get that screw out. But here's what that truss rod cover looks like. I'd say it looks air correct to me. And I did not see a Les Paul model silk screen on here. I saw that there's black paint in here, so I'm not sure if we had some sort of a, a finish touch up on here at one point in time that erased that, or if it just naturally worn off over the years. But I mean, we can still see through to the back of the neck. I didn't see any brakes, cracks, or repairs. Maybe something happened when they reamed the headstock for the Grover tuners, like it chipped or something, so they resprayed it or something. But there is that beautiful Gibson logo. And you can kind of see how they inlaid it into the headstock. They've got that outline there. All these little nicks and dings and whatnot when you get it in the light. I was curious how well they put these studs in here. So it doesn't appear it's the way Gibson normally does it. Well, at least not as clean. I mean, they put the bushing within the body, but it's not a like 100% snug tight fit. Like it sits down underneath the top. That was really hard to get out. So normally they have like a little thing at the top right here. So it's not just sunken in like that, but that's how both of these are. I couldn't even get this one out. It'll take a little bit more manpower. I guess the nice thing about that is that sits flush, but that's probably why that bridge sits so low on this body is because it doesn't have the normal height right here. So obviously you can adjust that up just a little bit too. 
Now we move on to the back side of this thing. So every nick and ding has a story, right? So up here, that's where the original toggle switch route was. So they just filled it in with some wood. And I was looking at the side, I was like, what is that like crack? Is that a crack I need to disclose? No, that's the original part within that where that would have been routed out as versus where the original wood would have been before they you know, sanded it all like that. So that makes complete sense. You can definitely see the witness line right here. You probably couldn't when it was first refinished, but over the years it definitely showed up. Maybe they moved the strap button in a few different locations, like there's some sort of a ding right here at least. But right now it's at the heel of the neck, but normally people would put it like right here. But since they sculpted it out in order so he could get up to the higher fret axis is better, it just made more sense down there. But the other one is down here in our regular location. But the one I wanted to talk about is this right here. There's like a small chip out of the body. He had a great story with this. So he was playing a gig with his friends and it started to rain. So he was running to his car, it starts downpouring. And then out of nowhere, a flash of lightning comes. And then it's just like everything is in slow motion for him. He sees that original lift and case just start to open all by itself. Because he was running with it, just holding it as the handle, but like one of the latches gave loose or something. So this thing fell out and smashed against the concrete right there. So relatively speaking, he came out pretty much unscathed. Just a very minor sliver out of the guitar right there. But that was the night he realized, yeah, probably should replace the case. He said it took him another couple of years. Until then, he's like me now. I don't care what case it is. I'm holding the lid closed too. Like, like I'll just put it under my arm like this just to make sure nothing like that ever happens. But I wanted to experience this with you guys because the pot codes in here should tell us when all these modifications were done just in case his memory was a bit hazy. So inside here, let's see what's been done. Oh boy, I've never seen those before. <laughs> like, are they broken or is that just how they're supposed to be? Maybe somebody who's more familiar with vintage guitars will be able to ID these, but it looks like the actual pot itself is like collapsed in on each and every single one in like the same areas. It's either that or they were just made that way because normally you can't see the inside and it moving. But this pot actually continues to spin, spin, spin. Like you can hear it, it just flips back to zero. I'm curious if that actually still works as intended. That might just be age that has uh, made these break, but who knows? We certainly have all that vintage dust in here. You've got old capacitors. Looks like brown ceramic discs. And then inside here, we have our crudely routed out toggle switch area. I'm surprised they just didn't go for a nice round circle, just enough to put that in there and then route it through there instead of it normally coming through here. Unfortunately, I was looking, trying to see if there are any date codes around the edges. I don't see any. So I'm not sure what kind of pots that guy put in here when he rewired this in the late 60s, early 70s. But according to the owner, it worked when he was doing his last goodbye play of this. He just doesn't play anymore. Unfortunately, his hands have come down with arthritis. I think he said he was around 70 years old. He's gonna sell this and use the money to go to Hawaii with his wife so he can help fund his trip. I mean, he doesn't have to sell this for that. He's doing that regardless, but <laughs> maybe he could have more fun on that trip. But the output jack has definitely also been replaced, or at least the jack itself. It's kind of a, a homemade metal guard right here because the original plastic one likely cracked probably even before he bought it would be my guess but here we can see how much wood they just took off of there like the neck doesn't feel unstable at all so i think you're pretty relatively unscathed i mean it's a bit ugly on this side but it feels good to play like not quite all access heel carve type stuff but good enough if you like a 50s player guitar but here we can see the original thin binding in the cutaway the black finish is non-original. They just did that to, you know, make the rest of this guitar look okay because they had to touch stuff up right there and it, it would just look weird if they would have did like a double stinger back here. You know, at the same time, that would have been really cool too. Just hide the sins and stylize them, whereas the rest you could just leave mahogany. But we're what, 50 years too late to make that decision? But he definitely used it since all that so there must be some good stories for gigs that have been long forgotten 
But there we go. Stinger, really clean. They got some nice lines on that. I know some arch tops, they would get it on the heel and up here. Those are cool. But as far as the neck, that does appear to be the original finish to me, which is fantastic because if you love 50s Les Pauls, but you can't like afford the original, the feel of the neck is everything to the guitar. So, I mean, yeah, when you're up here, it's not going to feel quite the same. I mean, the transition is pretty smooth. I don't think you're really going to notice it. Like this paint has a little bit more texture to it as compared to the original. But if you're just playing in this area, yeah, I mean, it just feels like a 50s Les Paul. And then I took one of the tuners off here just to show you guys. So the original Clusens, you can see the outline of them right here. They decided just to, instead of filling in the holes, they just put more screws. So I think that's actually a nice little touch right there. So if you wanted to swap back to Clusens, you could. I think you're going to be okay on the back as far as you know, showing that that had been replaced. But you'll forever be left with the giant washers or else you'll just have that giant line around them. And it just doesn't look good. Just stick with the Grovers. But you can do the conversion bushings in order to get around the headstock having to have been reamed. Just a little bit wider for the shaft of the Grover. But the Grovers themselves have some pretty good age to it. Milk bottle Grovers with the patent pending in the circle. USA. And here you can just barely read that serial number. Four something five four four ish i can't quite see it as good in this lighting as that other room but there's nicks and dings but i do not see any breaks cracks or repairs to this thing but i think we should uh take a look at this one under black light on the workbench all right so here we go clearly body finish is not original but you can go here to the neck and there you go you can see definitely glow in the way i would expect to see on a vintage les paul but kind of curious, there must have been like some sort of like a overspray on this at some point in time with a different type of finish. Because you can see it kind of glows right here. So maybe the cutaway areas actually got something a little bit different because it glows a bit different as compared to the rest of the guitar. But oh yeah, that is an old refinish on here. You can see the covers are glowing kind of a cool color too. These are a lot shallower than the modern day P90 covers. Like they're just just enough to cover it that's all it is but then again some of these i think they're also cracked a bit at the bottom but our pick guards looking pretty cool too as are our knobs here you can kind of see that area that i was talking about earlier a bit clearer i mean this stuff it looks pretty good to me I'm not claiming this is the original finish it was just some sort of a finish that definitely did age oh man even the inlays on this guy <laughs> that's pretty cool and then our headstock the cool thing about the fingernail wear is it tells the story of the guitar. Like before I even talked to Vance about his playing style, I knew he was a thumb wrapper because right here you can see where his thumb always rested against the fretboard all the way from looks like the fourth fret all the way up here to like the uh, looks like maybe 17th, 18th, maybe a little bit on the 19th. But he's definitely a pretty good player. Love to live in like that 15th to the all the way up here area. <laughs> so maybe not screaming lead solos, but definitely up until the 17th. It's cool how vintage guitars can tell their tale even without talking. And here she is all strung back up. As I was telling you earlier, I decided it was best to wrap tail this one because normally I don't top wrap guitars but with the bridge being so collapsed at that angle I figure this will be some much needed relief for it and it just makes the guitar feel a little bit slinkier in my opinion. Sometimes guitars set up well like this sometimes they don't. I mean the action obviously you can dial it down to whatever you do want but I thought this was very comfortable as is. As long as you press hard in this area you don't have to worry about that uh, fret popping up and causing any buzzing. But I am noticing a lot of these saddles are still buzzing because now there's not a lot of pressure down on them. But I realized we forgot to take a look at our uh, pickup readings. So bridge pickup is 7.76k ohms, which is what I'd be expecting. And our neck pickup is not wanting to read for some reason. <laughs> There we go. Just needed to clean the pots out a bit. 7.76-ish on the neck as well. So they're pretty balanced set here, and our middle position reads 3.88. Let's just take a second to appreciate the belly carve on this. So sometimes when you refinish a Les Paul, they're not very nice to the contours. Now granted, I haven't seen another 50s Les Paul in person, but 
this still has a pretty decent belly to it. Like you can really notice it from here to there. There's such a large transition. You can kind of see what I'm talking about right there. Lots of light nicks and dings. It was just so well used. Like I decided to uh, call him up as I was putting this thing back together and he told me some more tales. Like he didn't know anything about this. He just guessed that when they drilled it from the back to put this on here, probably just cracked the wood because it was dry. And then I uh, asked him about that headstock up here and it kind of makes sense. He doesn't remember anything ever happening up here, but maybe when they refinished the top, they also decided to redo the face. I'm not sure. It's either that or that just naturally wore off but still can't quite explain the black paint in there. Well, very cool. Only thing left to document on this beast is, A, its tone, but I'm talking about the weight. So let's react to that together here. Eight pounds, 12 ounces. That's pretty good. Now, I probably started life around nine pounds, I would guess, before we shave some wood out here and down there, but hey, that is a great weight. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it sounds. All right, let's go ahead and run through the tones of this vintage beauty. Let me explain the controls before we do this demo. The switch is actually in upside down. So this still controls the bridge pickup and this still controls the neck pickup, but this is actually pointing to the bridge pickup now and that is the neck, so it's reversed. But the controls are still in the same spot. So let's give our bridge a try. I'll be honest, it kind of sounds weak, not quite what I was hoping for. But then it's night and day when you switch to this neck pickup. I mean, listen to this thing now. Like this just sounds so full and lively. That's why it didn't surprise me when I was in the bridge position. I thought that was the bridge, but it's not. But then you combine them, you get a nice little middle position here. Obviously, all our controls do work. So this is the bridge volume. The bridge tone. Neck volume. 
volume. So far, the neck pickup is the clear winner here, but what I'm guessing this bridge pickup needs is it just needs to be raised up. When I took the screws out to look at these P90s, there were no springs underneath there. I'm not sure if the vintage ones had that. I think they did, or at least some sort of a foam will raise that up closer to the strings because that neck pickup is much closer. So maybe that's all that thing needs. But we'll kick in some distortion now. <laughs> interesting that bridge pickup definitely comes to life with some distortion maybe it's down there for a reason it gets maybe a bit too aggressive if you have it all the way up <laughs> We know all about this modified 1954 Gibson Les Paul standard. What are my final thoughts on this thing? A very nice eye-opening experience. It was great to finally try one of these 50s Les Pauls. Are they necessarily tons better than the modern day stuff? No, but I think it comes down to the history behind them. There's always a story to each and every single one of these, especially examples that got modified. So it was a great opportunity to get to document a guitar like this in a consignment. So remember, if you're interested in being the next owner of this one, you can check out my website, trogleysguitarshow.com. I'm gonna have a list price. He is open to offers, so go ahead and send him one if you have one in mind. I think this one definitely could use a little bit of a setup. I mean, I haven't done anything too crazily fancy to this. I did decide to lightly wipe it down. We're not talking like polish it up. I just thought, ah, let's get rid of some of the fingerprints. And I'm kind of regretting not cleaning that fretboard because, you know, it just didn't quite feel as clean as the modern day guitars. So I think cleaning the fretboard just enough to, you know, make it feel fresh again would be nice. Just be careful not to erase any of the patina that's on this because that's all cool. 
pretty much that's the only thing that made this guitar feel a little bit stiffer in my hands. It's just, you can feel this thing has definitely been played for many, many of years. The frets have a lot of life left to them. You can feel that, but at the same time, you gotta remember they're kind of smaller frets to start with. So if you're used to modern day fret wire, yeah, you're not gonna like these probably. Was it my favorite Les Paul I've ever played? No, but I just loved documenting the tale of this, knowing everything, getting to talk to who I consider the original owner. I mean, he's the one that owned it the longest. He's the one that had all these modifications. It was definitely a fun little process here. And that neck pickup is just killer on this thing. But what a cool guitar with a great story. And for me, that's what it's all about. I like collecting old guitars for the history of them, not only of the model itself. I mean, a 54 gold top, that's pretty cool. But this one just, you know, it has a cool story behind it. The stinger and all. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Share the video with a friend who you think would enjoy it. And we will catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. As always, if you're interested in being the next owner of one of these demo guitars, you can check them out on my website, troglisguitarshow.com. There's some links in the description. Mm -hmm.